Well, hello again. Welcome to another edition of Crop Life Retail Week. Paul Shrimp, there, Phil Goy. How you doing, sir? I'm doing good, sir. I got a decent fall day. I know all my trees were dropping leaves in bunches. I was raking all last night, and I know the dreaded S word is in the forecast for this weekend. Snow, possibly. <sighs> I was out of town for just a couple of days. I came back and I look out this morning and everything went from green to yellow in about the, you know, it seemed like about 48 hours. It's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing how one or two cold nights will just get all the leaves to drop like in mass, which is, uh, you know, again, it makes it easy because you rake once or twice and you're done. But uh, yeah. yeah, anyhow, a little, little sore yeah, this morning. So that's all right. Yeah, I hear you. Well, and I got that waiting for me. But anyway, speaking of things that aren't easy, um, last week after we signed off, um, we finally saw the uh, infrastructure bill get passed into uh, what I think is going to be lying eventually. If it may be signed now or it may not quite be signed yet, but uh, looks like that's moving forward. Uh, personally, I think it's a it's a it's a positive. I think we get. Um, you know, and, and as, as city people, we get to see our crumbling infrastructure every day. Um, and we note that the infrastructure, as opposed to countries like Brazil uh, and other places, is a measurable difference making asset that we have as a country uh, that we can move things around and can move things around efficiently. And we need to continue to be able to do that. So it's exciting that this stuff is passing, that we're going to be spending some money on it. And uh, it's going to pay back for everybody at the end of the day. So. I'm excited about it. I'm sure not everyone agrees out there, but I'm, I'm, I, I think it's gonna be a real positive thing. I know Kurt Blades from the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. He's been uh, working on this and the association with his team has been working on this for many years. And it finally came to fruition. I sent him a credit, congratulations and said, I know it's been a slog. And he said, it's definitely been a slog. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they're relieved that it's finally, uh, finally through. So. Uh, so congratulations to all those that were involved. There's been a lot of uh, trade associations I know that have also weighed in saying it's good. It's a good thing. So uh, congrats to everyone who was working hard on that whole process. Yeah, indeed, Paul. Yeah, I know the National Corn Growers and Fertilizer Institute and Agriculture Re Retailers Association, they all sent out press releases after the bill was passed, basically saying that this is a very, very good thing for the agricultural community in a whole uh, as a whole. And I know that one of the... Um, I know one of the bridges I, I guess I've heard is targeted to kind of get some little repair work based on this bill is, is one that you and I are probably very familiar with, the one that goes over the Ohio River between Cincinnati and Kentucky. I know I've uh, gone across that bridge many a times driving down to the National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, I hadn't realized, but uh, I guess it's rated uh, by the folks that watch and look at bridges across the country is one of the worst and desperate need of repair. So uh, it'll be good to see that bridge getting some work done on it. If you've ever been on it, you don't have to be an engineer to know that that's one of the most dangerous bridges. <laughs> you know what I'm talking scary, about. I mean, that's, that's yeah, that, that was very crossing. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so, you know, mostly I don't care about Cincinnati, but in that, in that case, yes, we definitely want those people safe and don't, we don't want to get hurt. I just want to get over the bridge, okay? <laughs> I just want to, yeah, I want to get to Kentucky. I want to get over the bridge, and I want to do it without, you know, uh, having to worry about any issue. So. Absolutely. So what else do we have going on? I know there's, there's been quite a few things in the news this week. Yeah, actually, uh, a couple of videos ago, we reported, of course, on the, uh, the workers uh, for John Deere going on strike. Uh, they were looking for some better conditions, wage concessions, uh, give back in terms of health care. Uh, and I guess the, uh, the union members were recently, they took a vote on a proposed contract from the John Deere management. Um, but they unfortunately voted that down, 55% to 45%. Uh, so a John Deere spokesperson called that offer the company's quote unquote last best offer but reiterated that that doesn't mean they're going to stop negotiating. They're going to continue to talk with the union at the bargaining table and hopefully try to get something done here uh, sooner as opposed to later. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. But again, 55 to 45 percent vote. Uh, it doesn't sound like the membership is all that uh, out of, uh, you know, out of uh, the possibility of approving something that might be a little sweeter in the near future. 
Yeah. It's, it's just weird. It's like back to the future for us in Cleveland, you know, I mean, when we were growing up kids in the seventies, I mean, it was like, there was a, there's a striker in negotiation. It seemed like every other month where something was going on. Um, and it's, I never would have imagined that this would be a, a thing again, but here we are. Um, and, uh, Boy, I just want to get those people back to work. I, I feel bad for anyone who's been in that situation, you know, growing up knowing my neighbors and so forth have gone through that and, you know, the battles. And I mean, some of those negotiations just have to happen, but, it, you know, it's a shame. And hopefully folks can get back to work and we can get back to normal and get people on the line who uh, who make equipment, who have experience with that and and, uh, and um, just get, get back to normal again. Well, obviously, yeah. Well, as soon as we get any word to that something is a settlement of some type has been reached, we will certainly let our viewers know. Absolutely. What else? Well, what else, Paul? We actually have a, uh, another announcement of a retirement and promotion going on in the marketplace for our friends at Bayer. Uh, I guess Rodrigo Santos uh, is going to be the new president of the crop uh, division for Bayer. Uh, he was previously the COO, but now he'll be heading it up, uh, replacing Leon Condon, who will be retiring on December 31st to pursue other interests. So our, uh, our best wishes to Liam. He's a good guy. I know I've talked to him in the past many times and looking forward to dealing with Mr. Santos here in the near future. Uh, I guess he came over as part of the Monsanto merger that happened back in 2000. And 18 and uh, has been working in Latin America and other parts of uh, Bayer. And like I said, he's been the COO since June of uh, 2021. So he'll be taking over the top spot here uh, come January 1. Sure. And all those big companies, so many challenges. I mean, you got sustainability and, and products being challenged in, in, in the marketplace and, you know, <laughs> needing to keep keep up with seed and technology and traceability. Um, so many issues. So uh, good luck and um, good luck. And hopefully we will see you down the road. Yeah. So Paul, of course, now it is time for your absolute favorite segment of the show. Time for fun with numbers. Great. You've already pre-warned me that I'm going to lose. So here we go. I, I haven't actually. And I, if you, if I did pre-warn you, because again, if you were paying attention to what I asked you before we went on air, uh, hopefully you will have a clue what this number ties to. So your number is nice and low this week, Paul. One as in 1%. And your clue would be something you're going to be talking about next week. Hmm. But what do you think 1% might represent given your agenda coming up in the next seven days? Oh, cheapers. Well, <laughs> I do know what I'm doing next week. I am, you know, we have our, our, our pace, uh, our pace executive series event on, uh, on sustainability and, and, uh, um, and carbon sequestration and the retailer and how it's going to impact. Hopefully that's not the number of uh, retailers who think it will have a positive impact on their business. Mm. I'm sorry, Paul, that's a buzzer, <laughs> but you're not that's that good. far off. This is actually, I, I, you know, if you're, if you're looking at that segment of the marketplace, this number is actually even worse than that. So our oh, friends awesome. at, awesome, oh. I know. Our friends at Purdue University uh, did a survey of 400 large growers and ranchers uh, in mid-October. And what they found based on the survey results is 1%, which if my math is right, is four of that 400, of those folks are actually looking at doing something with carbon contracts in 2022 season for their farming operations and ranching operations. So again, uh, only 1% of the folks they talk to are looking at carbon. So Again, there's a lot of uh, lot of work to be done on the grower side of the equation. So now, of course, you can plug what we're going to be talking about next week. Oh, you know, before we go there, one percent are looking into. It. I mean, I would think a lot more are looking into it now. Maybe only one percent are actually going to do something about it. But and that could be too. That wasn't exactly the way the release was worded. But uh, as again, one percent is a. I guess I guess they took a, the previous survey they took it the number was double that two percent so the number has actually gone down so 
I'm sorry, I'm just spreading the bad news over and over. I am, I apologize. Yeah, well, I mean, and it's gonna be, you know, and it's one of the things we're talking about with BASE is how, how can retailers get themselves involved and look into these programs in partnership with retailer or partnership with growers and partnership with their suppliers and other folks, you know, to get a look at some of these programs and see what might make sense. Um, a lot of them are still, you know, kind of in the oven baking, so to speak, in terms of um, in terms of how they'll come out. But there's some things that are out there that are that are compelling. Carbon is, is tough. Sustainability will be a little bit better because it's more company driven in terms of you know what companies want to do based on what they told their stockholders and so forth. So we're going to see certainly, I think, more of those being viable because they're all internally driven as opposed to. Uh, the carbon markets, and there's so much uncertainty about, you know, about, uh, you know, those programs and, and how they're going to pay off. So, um, yeah, that's, that's disappointing, but, you know, it's, it's not surprising given how much uncertainty there is around carbon. So, and, and you'd hope that sustainability, you know, practicing with sustainability programs, so to speak, practicing or, you know, honing your, your craft in terms of collecting data, understanding what's happening in your fields and all the things you do with sustainability will eventually, you know, translate into being able to do more carbon kinds of work. But um, yeah, it's, it's a, <laughs> it's still a very difficult, very challenging field to understand. Um, and some of the programs that come out have been less than satisfactory according to growers that we've talked to. So um, not Terribly surprising, but that certainly will be part of the conversation next week that we have. And I urge you to sign up for that Pace Executive Series uh, uh, event. What you can do is sign up for Pace, the, the Pace Executive Series in total, and then also uh, sign up for that individual um, uh, event. And we'll keep you apprised. We're going to have one this month, obviously next week, the 16th uh, in the afternoon. Uh, I'm sure we're putting that up on the screen if we haven't already. Uh, we'll also have one in December and one uh, in the early February. So uh, we want to keep the education kind of going through our PACE initiative and sustainability since the first shot out of the out of the box here uh, next week. So we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you on that call. Got some great speakers and uh, yours truly will be will be running the panel. So I uh, look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, we will look forward to that, Paul. Yeah, this this when I saw this number, it sort of reminded me of that that old joke about shoe salesmen. You remember that one, the, you know, because the number is so incredibly low. Uh, you know, there were two shoe salesmen and both went to like this village in, in some remote area. And um, the one wrote back to his boss saying no opportunities, no one wears shoes here. And the other one wrote back saying plenty of opportunities, no one wears shoes here. So, again, the bar <laughs> being this low for carbon among the grower community gives us a lot of opportunity to uh, sell them shoes, metaphorically speaking. So to speak. <laughs> I did say metaphorically. As long as we're selling, you know, fully formed shoes, right? <laughs> exactly. Made of carbon. Yeah, that's a great place to stop. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, that is a it for this edition of Crop Life Retail Week. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. If you have questions or comments about today's episode of Retail Week, contact us by email or Twitter or type your message in the comment section below. Your feedback is important to us. We'll try our best to address your thoughts in next week's episode. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel.